there. Welcome to Talking Europe from the European Parliament in Brussels. Today's debate concerns the biggest country in the world, the second biggest economy and the European Union's second biggest trading partner. It's also a country that's coming under suspicion over accusations of state-sponsored spying and the theft of trade secrets. I am talking about China. What kind of relationship should the EU and its member states have with China and Chinese companies and how suspicious should they be? We're joined today uh, by two MEPs, a German MEP Helga Truppel, first off, uh, who's a member of the delegation for EU relations with China. Hello there. And opposite you, from Italy, Alessia Mosca from the Socialist and Democrats group, uh, a member of the International Hello. Trade Committee at the European Parliament. Hi there. Hello. Um, so, before we get stuck into our debate, I thought I'd start with the news story that we've had in the last couple of weeks that's really brought this EU-China relationship to the fore. Uh, the telecoms giant Huawei, which is in the spotlight right now over allegations of both misleading the US about its dealings with Iran and stealing technology from competitors. Huawei's executives deny these claims and the company has just opened a new cybersecurity centre here in Brussels as it tries to combat Western suspicions. Luke Schrago tells us more. A black box for firms and governments to access Huawei's source code and collaborate on cybersecurity. That's how the Chinese telecoms giant has built its new Brussels lab, as it fights the mounting impression its proximity to Beijing could pose national security threats. In the last 30 years, we have been never received any order from the Chinese government to taking data back to China. Even in future, potentially, uh, if we received this kind of things. He said very clearly his personal statement as a founder and the CEO of this company. Uh, he will refuse. If he cannot, he will close the company. The United States points to China's 2017 cybersecurity law that requires Chinese firms to cooperate with its intelligence agencies and has made concerted global efforts to push its allies to keep Huawei tech out of their infrastructure. However, Europe's the firm's largest market outside China, and the continent has been reticent to follow Washington's lead, relying on EU-level legislation and cybersecurity measures to protect it. We cannot bar a company from outside Europe from the European market. Europe is open, but it's not up for grabs. There are standards. There are criteria which must be respected, and we'll follow them with the closest vigilance. Western companies have been working to catch up, but Huawei is currently the world leader in 5G network technology, and that leaves strategic concerns in play with decisions still to be made at the political level on the continued use of Huawei equipment. Well, there we go. Helga Truppel, I'd like to come to you first. I didn't mention before you're a member of the, the Greens group in the European yes. Parliament. It's important to mention. Um, now, as a member of this delegation for relations with China, you've actually been and visited Huawei's centres in China. So you perhaps better place than most of us to tell us how suspicious should we be. Yes, I think we have to be very vigilant and to a certain extent suspicious. When we were at Huawei in Shenzhen on the campus, it's like a little bit the the Google um, of um, China. Um, we were talking as MEPs uh, to the management of Huawei, and they tried to give us the expression that they are autonomous, that they are doing what they want and what is their economic interest. But all the time, a member of the Communist Party of China was sitting at the same table and monitoring them. And it was very clear that there is a very clear state influence and the influence of the Communist Party of China. So it's not an autonomous company. Huh? It's very much linked to the political interest um, of the government of China. But of course, uh, China's uh, democratic and economic development uh, you know, since the, the opening up to the rest of the world has been extremely rapid and accompanied with huge of economic course. growth. Uh, Huawei isn't a state agency, of course. It is a private company. We heard in our report there Vincent Pang, president for Western Europe of Huawei, saying, you know, if the company were to receive any kind of orders to do any spying, then the founder would close the company. Uh, they've continued to deny all these claims as well. Shouldn't we believe them? Um, I think it's not a question of being or not being suspicious and being or not uh, uh, being or, 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 or uh, believe them or not. I think that we have, be, we have to be very strict in respecting the rules and, and asking them to uh, have the same uh, set of rules that we have. And that means reciprocity. And this is what 
is lacking from our counterpart so far. Uh, China um, has a rule uh, that uh, allows the government to use data, for example. And this is something that is a completely, the completely reversal of the idea that we have in Europe and in other countries on how the government uh, can interfere in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the market and uh, how, they, how we can use uh, uh, sensitive uh, data from uh, our companies. So for this reason, I don't think that we need to have an aggressive or a suspicious attitude. It's not what the European Union wants to uh, have. We are only asking to have a set of rules which is clear and to have a transparent way of dealing with our partners, including China. Do you agree with that? Transparency, a uh, gentleman's agreement of reciprocity? I'm always in favor of reciprocity and transparency, but uh, you know, I have been maybe eight, nine times in the last 10 years in China and talked to human rights defenders, people under house arrest, in black jails. And uh, now we have more and more the development of a surveillance state in China with all these digital technologies. So, um, of course, it, I'm not in favor of calling now suspicion everywhere, but I think we have to be very clear in our analysis and what is going on in China and that the uh, government of Xi Jinping is very much top down and it's uh, very hostile to the human rights um, interests of a lot of Chinese citizens. Well, if uh, there are problems, then the EU can't simply stop trading with China. How would you approach no, but this it's relationship? A, it's, I would totally back her. It's about um, reciprocity, it's about good standards, uh, it's about openness and, of course, it's about trust, but trust must have a fundament. And so what I told you, when I was there with the China delegation of the European Parliament at universities, at so-called private companies, there's always the influence of the Communist Party of China. It's not our understanding from a liberal democracy. It's an authoritarian state and therefore I think with our strategic interest in trade, at least we have to be very um, cautious and we have to insist on our standards. Well, a lot of European companies are increasingly worried, I think. There was a case yeah. a couple of years ago with T-Mobile that had partnered with Huawei, uh, an issue of a, a Huawei employee who was accused of stealing some technology, a robotic arm. Uh, this was denied by the company and the case was uh, put to rest. Uh, but other countries, other trading nations, have taken a, a much harsher stance. We've seen with the United States, uh, you know, calling for the extradition of this executive recently, uh, ordering national uh, ministries, departments uh, of the government to, to not use Chinese technology or partner with Chinese firms. Uh, do you think that that's going too far? Uh, first of all, uh, the relation with China is the best example, I think, uh, to, uh, uh, to motivate uh, more and more uh, the fact that uh, the, uh, the European countries need to deal uh, uh, with uh, this country altogether. And so it's so important uh, to, uh, uh, to enforce and to strengthen the, the unity of the European Union, because only having uh, the uh, strength of uh, such a huge uh, um, partner, Chinese can be at the table at the same level, so we can talk with the same uh, power with uh, the, our counterpart, first of all. Second, I think that uh, the attitude that is taking the European Union is uh, the attitude that we should follow. Uh, for example, we, inter we introduced uh, just uh, one month ago these new uh, rules on uh, screening investment, uh, which is something that is uh, country neutral, so it's not against China, mm. but it's against, it's against uh, uh, attitude and behaviors uh, that are um, predators and that uh, could uh, uh, undermine uh, our security, the security of our citizens. And for this reason, I think that the um, value of being uh, rule-based, uh, which has always been one of the uh, value of the European Union, should be the, the direction that the European Union um, has, to, um, has to follow. But if there were found to be some serious transgressions, such as uh, spying cases, for example, which clearly the United States has serious suspicions about, um, 
you know, should there be... Uh, Maria Gabrielle said we can't bar a company from the European markets, but uh, surely companies can't be allowed to spy on European territory? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, they are going against the rule, and so in that case, uh, we have to take uh, countermeasures. countermeasures. This, uh, this, of course, but this, uh, is, uh, this means uh, respecting the rules. Mm. So if someone is going against the rules, uh, then we have to act uh, to, uh, uh, consequently. And that's, that's what our set of rules uh, um, allow us to do. Well, the EU is, of course, uh, principally, or in, in its origins, a trade body, really. It came from a sort of a trading uh, association. Um, but, of course, uh, member states are free to make their own decisions on, on great many matters. Um, the new or one-year-old government in your country, Italy, uh, seems to be very, very favourable towards Italy. I think Luigi Di Maio, the head of the Five Star Movement, has been to Beijing uh, five or six times in the last year. Uh, is that something that uh, we should be cautious about or is it something that could benefit the EU, do you think? Perhaps fostering better links, better understanding, better relationships? I think it's a completely wrong uh, uh, politics they are following. I, uh, I am completely in contrast with the, this line. Uh, and to tell the truth, uh, that, that party, the Five Star, Five Star Movement, uh, made a complete U-turn uh, in uh, what uh, uh, they uh, decided. Now they are in the government, uh, comparing with what they were saying before. Uh, so I think that uh, it's worrying. We have to contrast this attitude. Uh, not because I think that we don't need to have relations with all the partners, including China, but because I'm not saying that. I am saying that it's very worrying to act as a unique state, not in coordination with the other member states of the European Union, because, as I told before, only being together with all the other countries, we can be strong enough to, be, to have the same power of negotiations uh, which such, with such an important partner as China. Is that something that's achievable? We are seeing splits in Europe, aren't we, currently? I think there's a, a lot of talk about east-west splits, uh, talk about, uh, from Emmanuel Macron, progressives and populists. Is Europe able to speak with one voice uh, on, for example, human rights matters? Um, the democratic groups, yeah, they are able um, to speak out um, on a common basis for human rights. But, you know, we have uh, countries like Hungary and now the new government in Italy, um, and they, of course, they like, uh, to a certain extent, the authoritarian system of China and Putin. And that, of course, is a big risk for the European Union. I am a defender of liberal democracy and human rights and minority rights. And I hope that we can keep this um, basic attitude and politics of the European Union. But we know we have a lot of people inside, Le Pen, Brexiters and others, who really have another uh, concept of what the European Union should be. And that will be a big debate now in the upcoming elections as well. In terms of human rights, uh, the European Union uh, does have various agreements, association agreements, partnerships with countries uh, beyond the member states, of course, and, and rule of law, human rights issues are one of the priorities in those. Isn't fostering trade links a way of a sort of the, the carrot and the stick method of encouraging development in human rights? Could that yes, work in China? It, yeah. Uh, uh, in because general, it has such a strong economy. In general, uh, this is the approach that I think uh, we should continue to back, in the sense that engaging with some partners and asking them preconditions to start a negotiation and then engaging them in implementing what decided within an, an agreement is a, a way, as witnessed by our recent history, a way of helping uh, some countries to uh, improve their, their, their situation. Um, with, with some partners, uh, this, this uh, uh, story is not uh, feasible so far in the sense that uh, uh, if there are not some preconditions, it's not possible for us to, um, to open up um, talks and negotiations. And for this reason, we are not now having a, a, a round of negotiation with China on a free trade agreement, for example. So this is something that uh, is uh, in the deep nature of how the the um, um, European Union international trade has to be conducted and even more also in the future.
All right, I'm sure it's a relationship that we could talk about for quite a long time. I'd like to thank you both for taking part in our debate, though. And before we close off the programme, uh, I'd just like to stay with the theme of international trade for this week's Fake News Facts Check. Well, this story originated with a declaration by the head of the European election candidate list for France's far-right Rassemblement National, the party previously known as the Front National. During an election rally, Jordan Bardella claimed that the EU's international trade treaties were allowing imports into France of, quote, hormone beef, genetically modified salmon and chlorine-washed chicken. But Jordan Bardella is not the first person to make such claims. The European Commission rebuffed his assertion, however, in a tweet, saying that all three products are banned in Europe. So, who's right? Well, none of the products cited by Mr Bardella are commercially available in the EU, neither homegrown or as imports. The hormone beef ban dates back to 1988. All GM food, meanwhile, has to obtain official authorization and it has not been given in the case of salmon. As for washing chicken in chlorine, that was formally banned in the EU in 1997. Only drinking grade water can be used to decontaminate animal products. Well, the World Trade Organization is currently examining a challenge to this ban, but it is still in place for now. There are fears that the EU-Canada trade deal setter could lead to loopholes regarding such foods. Canada doesn't label GM salmon as such, raising worries that it could enter the EU fraudulently. The European Commission, however, has no say over border checks. This is a matter handled by member states. And that does uh, bring us to the end of this week's Talking Europe debate. I'd like to thank once again both of my guests, Alessia Mosca, thank you, and Helga Truppel, thanks for joining us. Thanks to you as well for watching the programme. We'll see you again very soon here on Talking Europe. Five hundred thousand families evicted from their homes. 80% of construction firms bankrupt. Ghost towns, 30% unemployment. Public sector wages reduced and taxes increased. Spain, shortly after the economic crisis of 2008. Today, things look better, but what price has been paid? We revisit Spain's economic crisis all this week on France 24.